And here I am again with Gern Blanston, and we're going to take a deep dive in Empire Strikes Back. How are you today, Gern? Gern. Hey, Pat. I'm great. How are you doing? Everything's pretty good, man. I had a great day so far. It's a wonderful day. Yep. Any day I get to like watch Star Wars as part of my job, it's not too bad. Not too bad at all. <laughs> I, so. just finished, uh, I just finished watching uh, Empire straight through for the first time in years in uh, preparation for this, uh, this talk. Excellent. Uh, although I have to say, I, I forgot how long it truly was. I gave myself two hours and I ran yeah. out of time. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's more than two hours long. It's like two hours, 10. I, I saw that too. I, I always thought that it was like the way movies were, in, you know, back then there were an hour and a half hour 45 was a long movie back in the eighties, yeah. but now, yeah, I saw that too. It was a long movie. Uh, and actually I watched, I know that you have the DVD versions like the ones that are closest to the cinematic theatrical mm. release as possible. Mm. Uh, I, I have those as well. But this time I actually watched the Disney Plus version, which I have been loath to do because of the changes. I do not want to change my, my memory of the classic as I remember it from my childhood. Yet we were talking before the camera went on, you were talking about somebody who watched uh, Batman in HD, the old Adam west batmans from the 60s on television and you said something about the utility belts yeah so uh somebody that uh, that i follow on twitter had had randomly pointed out uh he posted a, a screenshot of a close-up of uh the belt that the utility belt they put on on adam west and he said wait a minute are those yellow boxes on his utility belt sponges and sure enough when you look closely um they are they're un uh, unmoistened flat out of the package, uh, yellow sponges. It, it, <laughs> so in HD, you can tell, but of course with old fashioned TV, who knew? You had no idea. So filmmakers, uh, directors, prop design, uh, prop, uh, handlers, uh, set designers, they all knew the limitations of their equipment and they knew the limitations of the lens and they could know, they knew what they could get away with back then. Mm -hmm. Now, when a lot of this stuff is remastered, we see the flaws. Um, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I'm going to point something out. I hope it's not taken the wrong way. Uh, but, um, you know, just blemishes on people's skin. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you, you thought that that makeup made everybody look real smooth and everything. But, well, Mark Hamill is a really great example. They did a lot to Mark Hamill in that script. Like the fact that the Wampa scene was at, was at the beginning so that they could get him messed up. He in real life was in a car accident between the two movies. So right. in order to um, kind of explain maybe some of the facial scarring that you may have seen, uh, they just made that happen in the action in the movie early so that anything that would, would have been seen would have been, you know, attributed to that. But uh, and interestingly, you know, now, now online, uh, you get all these little details, everything is exposed and, and right. the DVDs are all released with alternate uh, tracks and behind the scenes. But I heard that story even in the 80s uh, as to why why the Wampa scene was uh, was added. Yeah, that was a, a pretty interesting uh, break the fourth wall kind of moment for me as a, as a, as a young man, uh, kind mm -hmm. of learning the process of how films were made and, and the fact that, yeah, I mean, they're made with limitations. There are certain things that you could do and you couldn't do. One of the things I like about Empire, uh, and it's still one of the least retouched of, um, mm -hmm. of Lucas's. I mean, anybody who talks about the differences will always say that Empire has got the least number of differences, which is nice, but mm -hmm. they're glaring to me. Uh, because I have that movie <laughs> memorized, basically. Uh, but but one of the things I do like is that most of the effects are practical effects. There aren't too many special effects. There's not a lot of blue. There's some green screen that was called green screen at the time. At the time, we call it blue screen now. But um, there was some of that with like the cockpits and that sort of stuff. But a lot of the ships were models, and uh, the mm -hmm. walkers were models. And you can see that they left some of that in. So so even in the Disney version that I'm watching now in 2021 which I, I don't know if it's the 2013, I forget when the last time George got his hands on it again uh, and, and changed things. But um, a lot of that, a lot of the beautiful, the, the, what I call beautiful flaws are there. You know, I can see that it's a model and I like that, you know, I actually enjoy that. It doesn't break the reality for me anymore. I, obviously the, the, the mystique it, on how these things were done has been broken because I've watched these DVDs with the special, uh, additions and that sort of thing but so you're absolutely right about it being the the least retouched and my recollection is is that uh there was the re-release of all three original films in the theater 
uh, because Phantom Menace was going to come out the following year. So I think they were all re-released in 97 or 98, something like that. Um, and you're right. Uh, Star Wars, the original, has a lot of uh, a lot of added special effects because, you know, he couldn't do all the things that he had in his, ma in his imagination, or so he says. By the time that Empire came along, things had developed even further. He had a bigger budget. Um, and there really was very little to retouch. And I think that's also true of... Um, of uh, Jedi, the, there really is very little um, added. Uh, the walkers they left alone because that's that's classic stuff, stop motion, the tauntauns. Uh, so just rewatching it today, I, so I, I usually skip the beginning part. I go straight to the action sections. Um, but in rewatching it, I was really impressed with how how the tauntauns were done. There was a lot of we hide a little bit here, we have it run behind the snow there, we put it in some fog over there to kind of conceal the flaws and limitations of the technology. But even so, it holds up pretty well. Um, but you know, I had a thought about Tauntauns as I was watching this. Uh, they talk about uh, when Han has to go looking for, for Luke because he's, he's caught after dark in, in intolerably freezing conditions. And uh, one of the rebels warns, you know, your Tauntaun will be dead before morning. Um, which makes me think, are Tauntauns native to Hoth? Yeah, I'm thinking they are. And the reason I'm thinking they are is because you see the bones in the Wampa Cave and they sort of look like Tauntaun bones. Like you see that one series of, it looks just like ribs, you know? In the oh, yeah, I totally agree. And, but, and I, I, but if they are, then they should be able to survive the night, right? Either that or they always retreat to some kind of cave at, right. at night for shelter. Right. right. But I so, thought, you know, there was a possibility that Maybe they brought these animals with them. I don't know. So here's, I, I've thought about that too. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think they brought them with them. I, I don't think they were like horses or, you know, yeah. like the Spanish bringing horses to the new world. But, but, it, but here's the weird thing about Star Wars is that almost everything is intelligent. So, it, you know, even though these are beasts of burden, they may have a certain level of intelligence in that you know they would retreat to a shelter of some kind at night it's never described you know that way but when you've seen other creatures um that that are in that star wars universe i mean obviously not the snakes in the cave you know and you know on dagobah and that sort of thing or the ones that get caught in the engine um that luke's taken out when he's going to leave mm -hmm. but but um the the ones that are created um they all seem to have some kind of you know, I don't know, like some kind of innate intelligence. And yet there's always this really, really disturbing um, theme that like these beasts burden are, are these semi-intelligent creatures are either used as, um, you know, beasts of burden or, or forced labor or whatever you want to call it, or um, they're just killed, <laughs> just like, like just slaughtered, you know, like out of hand. So uh, it's kind of uh it's kind of a weird thing in Star Wars. And I've seen some people go off on that, you know, like um, talking about, especially talking about droids and how droids are treated in the Star Wars universe. And actually it does bring up something I was watching. I was watching, um, I'm, I, I didn't know if we were gonna do this chronologically or if we were gonna like, but since we're on this one particular subject, I'll just address this while it's here. Uh, and then maybe I'd like to hit some of the major points that I don't wanna forget about hitting. But this one was, was glaring to me was, the way 3PO talks about Chewie, like he calls him all kinds of names. Like he calls him, hey, Wooly, you Wooly. Um, he says, uh, you um, uh, uh, mop head. He calls him a mop head, you know? Um, you would think that since they are the two like uh, most uh, tossed about characters, the least like uh, uh, respected characters, that um, they would form a bond, you know? But instead, like, you know, uh, 3PO's no, antagonizing no, you know, him. Meanwhile, Chewie put no. him back together and went looking for him. You know. You know why that? You know why they don't? Uh, they don't bond. Um, everybody likes Chewbacca and respects him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because he's he's Han's sidekick and pal. Yeah. Um, he's his mechanic. Uh, he's a co-pilot. He's clearly very intelligent. Well, um, he's also very old. We find out. You know, like he's. We find that out in Solo, you know. It's like, how old see, are you? No, but oh, you look so young. The difference is that nobody respects 3PO. 3PO is there as a comic relief, uh, a, a, a constant irritant. He is a continual irritant at every point in the movie. Um, although he does serve a good, he serves a good purpose because he's, he's, I'm sure there's a cinematic term for this. 
he's the audience voicing reaction when they're about to, uh, well, he says at the beginning, when Luke is locked out, you know, the odds of survival of, of 724 to, uh, to one against, though I've been known to be wrong from time to time. Um, so that's very inconsiderate, but the audience is thinking this. Uh, or also it's exposition. He's Basil exposition. He's letting you know that the likelihood he's going to survive is almost is, is extreme danger. Or when they go into the asteroid field, he's the audience saying, this is, this is a terrible thing. This is a very stressful. You're never going to make it. So he always seems to serve that function, especially at the very end of the movie, where if he weren't there, the ending would be very different because Leia and Chewbacca are attempting to rescue Han, get to him before Boba Fett takes him away. That whole sequence would be nothing but a shootout the whole way if it weren't for 3 people being strapped to Chewbacca's back narrating the whole time. That's a really good point. I don't think I ever thought of that before, but you're right. Without that voiceover, without that extra voice, it would, you're right. It would, it would be a great action sequence, but it wouldn't have any humor and it would be just another action shoot him up kind of thing. But instead it's extremely memorable because of what he says and because the interaction of the two robots. So you got, you got three characters, you know, if you want to include Lando, like, you know, fighting off the bad guys. And then you have like this kind of like, uh, you know, 3PO and R2 are having this conversation, like, and yes, they're affected by it, but they're also like a little more aloof about it too, you know, like, and they're like, there's a reunion, you know, they're like, he's like, oh my gosh, R2, where you been? You know, like kind of thing. And then he's like, how am I supposed to know the difference between a power conduit and a, you know, a data port, you know, like I'm not, I'm an interpreter, you know, like, and there's See, that kind of that, humor, you know? Right. They're, they're, yeah. he, you know, he, uh, they, for whatever reason, uh, Lucas decided in the first movie, I'm going to have one of these robots not speak. It's going to, it's like, maybe it's because he's going to be the, the Stan Laurel and 3PO is going to be Oliver Hardy. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, they do use that a lot. Like he uses the joke and you, you know, when, whenever you can tell R2 has a, has says to him at one point, you've never looked better because C-3PO says, of course I've looked better, you know? Yes. So you can imply what, three, what, what R2 is going to say, and sometimes you can't, and that's the game, right? So that's, you know, the audience can, sometimes they know what, almost exactly what R2 said, and other times they have to invent it. So it's well, more engaging that way. It mm -hmm. is. And so it, it, it seems like these are just uh, there for throwaway comedy, you know, low-level humor. But as a plot device, um, in that movie, it's particularly effective. I don't know if it's very important in the rest of the movies, quite honestly. I, I think that uh, in the other movies, they had to work really hard to find a role for uh, for the robots. Well, 3PO has a big role in this. R2, not as much, but 3PO has a really big role. I think right. um, the back to what I was thinking about um, Chewbacca and uh, 3PO not getting any respect. When Luke is um, having his visions on Dagobah and he has to leave, right? Because he's his friends. He says, my friends, you know, are being, I don't have to go save my friends. And he says that several times. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. at one point, um, you know, Ben and, and Yoda are trying to talk him out of it. And he said, mm -hmm. and he says, and sacrifice Han and Leia. If you honor what they, uh, what they fight for. Yes. But conspicuously absent is Chewbacca and mm -hmm. 3PO. He doesn't say, and sacrifice Han and Leia and Chewbacca and 3PO. Now I know as an actor and in cinematic pacing, that wouldn't work as well as a, as a delivery, as a line. However, yeah, but those those you characters are side, like those, those are characters so are those characters are sidekick characters. Yes, yes, yes. So they're not they're not the ones that are driving the drama. They're not the ones that you feel uh, strong emotions for. Yeah, until Chewie gets his medal eventually, because like eventually. you know the fact that Chewie didn't get a medal in the first movie has been such that that made me mad as a kid. Like I just yeah. didn't get that. Yeah. Like this, yeah, you know, second class citizen. Yeah, like really treated like like the species. Yes, almost, almost, absolutely, yep. you know, almost. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, all right, so. A, you're, one more point. Go ahead. You're talking about, uh, you know, maybe these, these two characters get pushed around a lot, might form a bond. There's a scene in, in Empire where uh, after, you know, Chewbacca's in the torture chamber and, and he's got uh, 3PO's parts in a box. He starts putting them back together. And then eventually 3PO realizes his head's been inserted on backwards. And when he says that, <laughs> Chewbacca laughs. Yeah, yeah. So 
So it's almost like he did it on purpose. Well, yeah, up. or he, yeah, yeah, or he's just a happy-go-lucky Wookie, you know. Like, oh well, other. you know, I was working on exactly. it, but I ah, screwed up. What can I do, you know? Yeah, yeah he doesn't yeah. get stressed. Well, at one point, three PO says he's only he's only only a Wookie. A Wookie. Yeah. Oh my gosh! I mean, what yeah. a dead giveaway right there! Yeah. It's like, come yeah. on, like in a court yeah. of law, man, you're you're you just your character has been assassinated right there. The yeah, he he would have to go <laughs> for some kind of uh, sensitivity retraining. I do think. I agree with you. Like yeah. yeah. Oh, well, actually, but everybody hates him anyway. I mean, everybody hates 3PO. He's just, he's, you know he's, what, though? Here's okay. So, we're, we, I don't know why we start with 3PO, but here's while we're start <laughs> while we're on 3PO, there, there is a redeeming moment. Okay. And it's in the torture chamber, like you said. Okay. So, here's where we know because the whole time 3PO is a coward, right? He's us in a real, in a real acting realistically to an incredible situation, right? Right. Asteroids, star destroyers, fighters. You know, oh my gosh! And surrender is a perfectly acceptable alternative. <laughs> you know, in extreme circumstances, the empire may be gracious enough to uh, uh, you know, uh, turn yeah. off. You know, um, that's you know almost an hysterical reaction, which is a normal reaction in in that kind of level of stress, right? However, when when Chewbacca puts them back together, the first thing he says is. Stormtroopers, here, we're here. in danger. I must alert the I others. I must warn the oh, others. No. Yes, I must warn I've the others. I've been shot. Oh, no, I've been shot. And of course, the oh no, I've been shot is one of the most wonderful classic, you know, like re comic relief lines because we know he's been shot. But would you actually <laughs> say that out loud? Like, I mean, I don't know. I've never been shot. But like, if I had been shot, would I say, oh no, I've been shot, you know? Perhaps if you were, perhaps if you were an android. Or an English butler. We're an English butler, which, which is what he's, uh, Anthony Daniels yeah. always said he modeled the character after a proper English. Butler. Well, it's perfect because I, that's absolutely the sense that I get. I, I, I think he's an amazing actor through that mask. I mean, how how he conveys all that emotion with no face like the yep. changes. All, all he does is move his head around, but you yep. in his arms, but you get the emotions, you know. I, I give him props time. for that because I, I think that anybody who's working behind a mask, and there are a lot of characters working behind masks uh, in these movies, yeah. uh, it's, it's hard. And uh, slight um, head motions, shoulder motions, hands, uh, all these little motions uh, really add up to something overall that in, in the wrong actor could you know, really kind of kill the energy of the character. Well, I mean, David Prowse gets a lot of like, you know, uh, unlove because of things that he said and all kinds of things that happened, you know, they're off camera. But but mm -hmm. one moment that I really remarked about rewatching it was uh, when Luke and we'll we'll talk about this scene in great depth because I think this is the pivotal scene in the movie. But when Luke um, lets go of the catwalk and and falls because it's his only escape, um, mm -hmm. you know. Vader has his arms stretched out. Come with me. Mm -hmm. It is the only way. And when Luke falls, his arm drops with him and his head comes down and you see the mask and you almost see despondency on the mask. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. reading, of course, I'm reading into this because the mask has not changed. But no, because I, I, I have exactly the same uh, feeling that you do. It's the one time where you can uh, really feel that uh events have got the better of vader yes. this is this is uh, he couldn't control this moment no uh here, here's a character that's always in charge no matter where he is and he blew this one yeah he did